This is Bangladesh, an economy historically associated more with floods than being a future economic powerhouse. Yet, that's exactly what it's tipped to be. Bangladesh was the fastest growing economy in the Asia Pacific in 2018, reaching an all-time high of 8.2%. Such high growth is nothing new to the country though, with the UN projecting it will lose its least developed country status by 2024. Though Bangladesh isn't just satisfied with leaving poverty, and nor should it be, it's set to achieve prosperity, aiming to become a developed country in the next 20 years with Goldman Sachs labelling Bangladesh a next 11 economy, one of the 11 economies set to be the largest in the 21st century, alongside the BRICS. However, this bright future is still some way off. We're talking about an economy with a poverty rate over 20%, where the GDP per capita is $1,880 and where the second largest export is financial remittances. Which all really raises the question of how. How is it fighting its way out of extreme poverty? And why now? What's Bangladesh's development model? In many ways, Bangladesh is following the same playbook Far East Asian nations did on their rise to becoming tiger economies, capitalising upon a low-skilled labour force to develop competencies in labour-intensive export industries. And if there is one thing Bangladesh has a lot of, it's labour. You see, it has the 8th largest population in the world, with an urban population growing at over 3% a year making labour-intensive employment in manufacturing great for absorbing and expanding workforce. Now, a steady supply of labour-intensive jobs has been provided by the outflow of jobs from one country in particular, China, part of a wider trend across Asia as labour in the world's largest factory becomes more expensive, particularly for labour-intensive industries such as the ready-made garments or RMG industry. This is a sector of monumental importance to Bangladesh's whole development. So more on that in a moment. The emergence of Bangladesh's industrial base is underpinned by a high level of macroeconomic stability, a core part of its development model. For example, Bangladesh has a very manageable debt load, a consequence of responsible fiscal management and prudent deficits, being keen to avoid the debt trap other developing nations such as Sri Lanka have found themselves in. This stability extends beyond borrowing, as highlighted by the nation's relatively low inflation rate, afforded in part by a steady supply of foreign currency due to an extremely high level of remittances, which as already mentioned is its second largest export ranking in the top 10 countries for overseas workers. Though as important as they may be, remittances just won't be responsible for turning Bangladesh into a tiger economy. But maybe fashion could be. Why the ready-made garment industry is crucial to Bangladesh. Rarely, outside of oil economies or small islands, do we find an economy so heavily dependent on one source of foreign income. And make no mistake about it, Bangladesh is extremely dependent on the ready-made garment trade. Just take a look in your own wardrobe and chances are you'll find a Made in Bangladesh label, with garment exports making up over 80% of the country's export earnings, along with the majority of its manufacturing base. Yet what's seldom asked is why Bangladesh is such a big player. After all, there are plenty of other countries with cheap labour and frankly better transport infrastructure. Well, the answer to this stems from a chance joint venture more than 40 years ago between Bangladesh's Desh Garments and a South Korean firm called Daewoo. You see, back in the 1970s, Bangladesh had virtually no ready-made garment experience. South Korea was a larger player, with the Busan-based Daewoo company having a problem. South Korea was so successful they had been quoted out of exporting further garments to the US. This led to an opportunity for Daewoo to set up shop in Bangladesh for export-only business, and hence a joint venture was born. Desh Garments promptly sent over 130 employees to learn advanced techniques and management practices in South Korea, implementing them back in Bangladesh. Yet, there were still two main problems. The first, was expensive import duties in Bangladesh against imported raw materials the industry needed. Typically, such duties are paid up front, which poses a cash flow problem. However, the South Koreans had dealt with this problem before, and with their help, facilitated a bonded warehouse system, which basically enables goods to avoid import duties, provided they are kept in bonded warehouses and are for export, warehouses managed by the factories. 
though another key problem remained. How Desh Garments could pay for expensive imported raw materials up front. Now, this is a common problem manufacturers face, particularly ones in developing markets with limited track record. Desh Garments got around this by approaching the Central Bank of Bangladesh and devising a back-to-back -back credit system. This can get quite detailed, but essentially entails a bank lending the factory credit, eliminating the credit risk, freeing up the supplier to deliver the much needed imported raw materials. With the help of the Bangladeshi government, a whole new industry was born, and after a few years, some of those 130 employees set up their own ready-made garment factories, again with government support, ultimately leading to the industry Bangladesh has today. However, as important as government support has been, Bangladesh's greatest comparative advantage is fundamentally its cheaper labour. The nation has a minimum wage equivalent to 41% of its major competitors, Vietnam, China and Cambodia. Even after accounting for the relatively lower productivity, its workers are still paid relatively less. This raises all sorts of problems around living standards, but from an investment perspective, this can seem an attractive proposition. Though to stop there would be way too simplistic. A less talked about economic advantage stems from its least developed country status. Why Bangladesh's least developed country status helps facilitate trade. A least developed country is an unfavourable title used by the UN to refer to low-income countries confronting severe structural impediments to sustainable development. These are highly vulnerable to economic and environmental shocks with low levels of human capital, of which Bangladesh is one of 47 countries. So it's not something unique to Bangladesh, but the way the country is capitalising on its LDC status is impressive. You see, LDCs are typically given preferential trade with developed countries, such as low to no tariffs, more generous quotas, or just trade agreements on more generous terms. And Bangladesh has been capitalising on this, particularly in its ready-made garment sector. This helps explain why about 60% of its ready-made garment trade goes to the EU, a logistically far away market, but one where it benefits from the EU's most favourable regime, the everything but arms arrangement, which, as the title suggests, grants the nation free access to the EU for exports of all products except arms and ammunition. Though as mentioned at the beginning of this video, if the predictions are correct, Bangladesh is set to leave LDC status by 2024. This poses a bit of a problem. Whilst a lot of the trade agreements Bangladesh has struck won't change the minute it shakes off the LDC label, this may act as a barrier to future agreements or emerging industries, as Bangladesh seeks to diversify away from ready-made garments. So you could call it an unintended barrier stemming from development success. So what are the other main barriers facing Bangladesh? Well, let's not forget that for all the talk of the future, Bangladesh still suffers from extreme levels of poverty and inequality, one rooted in a largely rural population with over 60% still residing in rural areas where opportunities are limited, yet one which is rapidly urbanizing, a key factor in any transition to prosperity. But this mass rural to urban migration brings its own set of challenges as infrastructure and public services are overwhelmed. At the household level, malnutrition is still a very real problem, with over 30% of children under the age of 5 having stunted growth, which can have a permanent impact on physical development, and with it, wider societal development at the macro level. Linked to this is the fact that the nation is still a large recipient of foreign aid, equivalent to 2% of GDP. Unfortunately, the impact of aid is one of decreasing returns for every dollar spent. The reason for this? Well, researchers point towards institutions lacking the capacity to utilize aid effectively. And this really reflects a wider point, reflecting the weakness of institutions and public infrastructure, with the World Bank stating Bangladesh is the world's most expensive place to build infrastructure, in part due to the nation's high vulnerability to natural disasters. For example, floods are estimated to cost Bangladesh 2.2% of GDP per year, a cost which is likely to increase due to rising sea levels and climate change. Intriguingly, a potential positive area for Bangladesh, remittances, also has an unintended consequence. Whilst remittances have declined from over 10% of GDP a few years ago, inflows of cash have been found to alleviate poverty, but have a negative impact on GDP growth. 
a 1% increase in remittance growth was found to lower GDP growth by 0.05%. This is because in Bangladesh's case, remittances are used primarily for consumption as opposed to productive activity like investment, as well as raising the exchange rate, impacting export competitiveness, and acting as a brain drain for talent to work abroad. Importantly, a consequence of these barriers has been Bangladesh's relatively disappointing foreign direct investment record. Although the general trend is upwards, foreign direct investment inflows were down a staggering 56% in 2019. The Bank of Bangladesh explains this through failing to deliver the last quarter's data in time, with the true figure only down 20%, a substantial decrease nonetheless. And, to be honest, this is a weakness Bangladesh is acutely aware of, as the World Bank's Doing Business report ranks it 168th out of 190 economies for doing business. For a developing economy, this is an issue. The end impact of FDI is hotly debated, but it provides a host of benefits beyond just cash, enabling amongst other things the transfer of new technology, knowledge, greater productivity, and connections to vital foreign markets. So, we've highlighted some of the main barriers facing the nation, which in truth could be its own dedicated video. But ultimately, despite an extensive list of challenges, Bangladesh is tipped to overcome them on its way to the Economic Hall of Fame. So, how does Bangladesh plan to take its economy to the next level? Bangladesh, like many countries' fortunes, will be increasingly tied to China's. Due to the transfer of jobs we mentioned earlier, and the China Plus One policy many international firms are implementing meaning the country is set to be a big winner. To continue to step into this role, the nation is planning to attract much-needed FDI through setting up special economic zones, about a hundred of them. These special zones will operate under favourable taxes and regulations, though the setup is just part of the equation. It's recently enacted a One-Stop Service Act to provide all the required services to investors from the same point, avoiding the bureaucratic headache plaguing companies for years. It also intends to link its new zones with the nation's cheap and growing educated workforce, producing over half a million graduates a year. Importantly, this is part of a wider plan to diversify the economy away from the ready-made garment industry. Now, don't get it wrong, Bangladesh is still planning to grow that sector, but simultaneously diversify its export base to more high-value sectors as well. The nation is targeting more lucrative value chains, particularly the tech sector, to really propel its economy. And with the second largest digital workforce, it has a ready-made supply of workers. Whilst Bangladesh may have been dealt a poor hand geographically, with two-thirds of the country less than five metres above sea level, population-wise, its historically rapidly growing population, for years a burden, is increasingly becoming a demographic dividend. You see, Bangladesh is entering a Goldilocks zone. On the one hand, previously high population growth has led to a young workforce, while simultaneously a falling fertility rate to around 2.1 compared to the 4.6 average of low-income countries means families today are having fewer dependents. This slowdown will be particularly beneficial to the agricultural sector, where resources are fixed, meaning additional workers translate into diminishing returns, something which suppresses per capita income in low-income nations. So overall, Bangladesh is in the middle of a remarkable transition from being a low to middle-income nation, recording the fastest growth rate in the Asia-Pacific region. Analysts predict its march will stretch far beyond escaping extreme poverty to be one of the leading economies by the middle of the century. The development model it's following is the same one Far East nations used, one based on cheap labour in labour-intensive export industries. The backbone of this transformation has been its sizeable ready-made garment sector, but it is looking to diversify beyond this to higher value industries as it develops. Before it reaches its goals, it will need to overcome extensive barriers, given its environment, extreme poverty, relatively poor infrastructure, and difficulties attracting FDI. One it is likely to do through capitalizing on its demographic dividend, high number of educated graduates, and rapidly urbanizing population. Now, we want to hear what your thoughts are. Do you think Bangladesh will become a miracle economy? Will it be able to successfully diversify from its dependency on the ready-made garment sector to drive growth? Let us know in the comments below. The Alt Simplify team hope you've enjoyed this video. And if you think we've earned it, please consider hitting that subscribe button and leaving a like. It really helps grow this channel. And as always, see you in the next video.